Albanian blood. Welcome everyone to another episode of Mafia Truth with John A. Light. I'm Felix Levine to my left, John A. Light. And before we get into it today, a quick reminder to subscribe to our Patreon channel. All content goes up there early. There's bonus content, the ability to ask John live Q&As, and also make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. And today, our guest, Anthony Ruggiano Jr., Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor to have you uh, on our show. It's a pleasure to be on your show. And uh, so I'm Anthony Ruggiano Jr. I'm the son of Fat Andy Ruggiano, who was a made member of the mafia since 1953 when Albert Anastasia was the boss of the Mangano family. And it's a pleasure to be here. Hey, uh, so listen, for the people that don't know, because this is uh, a unique story. Mm. For the people that don't know, John Gotti loved Albert Anastasia. He was a big fan. And when we were there on a Saturday, we were at the Bergen Club, and we were all at a table one time, and he asked you, do you remember what he asked you? Yeah, he asked me to tell the fellas at the table, who was a bunch of wise guys, John was there, I was there, we used to have lunch there on Saturday afternoon, to tell them the story about my father's first hit for Albert and, the, and that family, which was at the time, like I said, the Megano family, which later became the Gambino family. So it was when my father was 25 years old, and it was in the 1950s, and uh, he was with, uh, he's finally got on record with Charlie Waggins, who also is the same person that proposed John Gotti. They were proposed by the same person, my father and John. And uh, so Charlie had asked my father a question that Albert, Albert Anastasia proposed the question to Charlie and he brought it to my father. And the question was, if you were asked to kill somebody for this family, would you do it without asking any questions? And my father at the time, who was around 25 years old, uh, said yes that he would. So um, moving forward a little time later, Charlie came to my father and told him that some guy had to get killed. And uh, they picked up my father at my grandmother's house because my father was 25. He was still living home with his mother. And my father always told me that he looked like a kid. He didn't really shave much. And he looked like really younger than he was. And he got in a car with Charlie Wagons was driving and there was a guy sitting in the front seat and Danny, who was Charlie's brother, was in a crash car, and my father told me that uh, when the car pulled out away from your grandmother's house, I leaned forward and I whispered in the guy's ear. Hey, everybody. I have a new sponsor, Dina Luzzi, with the new energy drink. Actually, everybody knows I'm full of energy. I'm always moving around. People want to know how. Take a blast. Dina's new stuff. Felix, take it. Need a blast? Get a blast. These great tasting drinks are Italian made. Go check the link in our bio today to get a case of Dino Luzzi right now. Yeah, my father had a nickname. Albert used to call my father at the time the kid. That was his pet name. Um, and uh, my father, you know, told me, you know, back then it was about suicide missions. That's what they did back then. Albert had a potato farm up in New York, and a lot of guys went up to the potato farm and never came back. <laughs> so my father never went to the potato farm. My father said, when I did a piece of work, and Albert, if he ever offered me to go on the potato farm, I just would tell him in a nice way. I have my own places to go on the land banks anyway. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, it was a different world back then, you know. Um, so, yeah, Albert loved them. And, you know, Al, he, my father always told me that Albert Anastasia was the toughest guy he ever met and Carlo Gambino was the smartest man he ever met. He always had a lot of respect for both of them, but Albert was his, his idol. Uh, as a matter of fact, when Albert got killed in 57 or whatever it was, my father was actually driving in the car with Tony Lee going to Manhattan to meet with them, to go to the club to meet O'Neill, who was the captain at the time. He was actually on his way into the city to see Albert when uh, when Albert got killed. And when Al Albert actually died, when Albert actually got killed, my father went on the lam because my father's regime was Albert's main hitman. Tommy Rabbit was my father's captain, and they were the main guys that did all the work for Albert. And when Carl became the boss, Tommy disappeared. You know his son, you know yeah. Davey Rabbit. Right. His father Tommy disappeared, which was my father's captain, and my father and his whole crew, Frankie Martin, Mike, Mike Catalano from the Bronx, the, all of them, Mike Talley, Neil, they all went on the lamb, and they actually wanted to try to kill Gambino. And my father always told me the story. They tried to set Carl up in Grand Central Station. They thought he would come to Grand Central Station to meet with him meet with Neil, and uh, they figured he would be safe there, and they were actually going to just pull a kamikaze mission and try to kill him right in Grand Central Station. And the day of the hit, 
Carl was supposed to show up and some old timer from another family came that was good friends with Arneal and told them that Carl wants to bring them all in and straighten it out. And my father told me that they went to Carl's house one at a time in Carl's basement. And he told them that uh, he knew they were soldiers and uh, they were just taking orders because Sal Carl's cousin had got whacked and because Albert really didn't like Carl. And uh, then Carl straightened it out and took them back in. And the ironic part is that my father was to tell me, and the ironic part was that then Carl made Neil the captain, and they became the main guys for Carl. Yeah. So he knew Carl. That's why my father always said Carl was the smartest guy he knew, because he, he took them all back in, and he knew what he had there. Right. And he made Neil the skipper. Then he actually made Neil his underboss, because he knew, you know, that's how intelligent he was. So, you know, this, these, were the, these were my bedtime stories growing up, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no Dr. Seuss. Yeah, no Dr. Seuss. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, what, yeah. what was the relationship like, first of all, between you and your father, and also, you know, how much did your father tell you or bring in the house? Because I know that a lot of, you know, formerly mafia members didn't want to bring their outside business into the house. Well, my, my, my relationship with my father growing up as a child was just a father and son relationship. I mean, my, my life lessons were a little different than normal kids. Like, I always knew in my house that it was different than my cousins and my friends. Like, I knew their fathers were home all the time. My father was out all the time. There was always men in my house with suits and ties, people coming in and out. My father would take me to the bar. People would stick money in my pocket. I saw my father getting arrested a few times, taken out of the house in handcuffs. But back then, all the cops were on the take. He would come back home. He would go. I remember one time he told my mother, give me all the money in the house. And he took, and my mother gave him all the money in the house, and then he left with two cops, and about an hour later, he came back. So, but, 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 you know, he took me to the Little League games, like John will tell you. He took us to the fights. He taught me how to box. He taught me how to fight, but my life lessons were different. So, like, I'll give you two examples. The first example I'll give you, when I was a kid, I was about eight years old, and I was sitting in front of my Aunt Mary's house, and this guy pulled down on a motorcycle, and a roll of money fell out of his pocket. This was in the early 60s, and I ran up, and I got it, right? And I took it in my house, my Aunt Mary's house, and they were all in there drinking and smoking, and I said, Dad, look, this fell out of Aunt Mary's neighbor's pocket, and he opened it up, and it was $80, and he took it, and he put the rubber band back on it, and he gave it back to me. He said, here, don't spend it all in the same store. <laughs> yeah. And the next day, he took me to Manor Sports. Man. Right, oh, man, it's so man, man. man. Yeah. And yeah. he yeah. took me to Manor Sports, and I bought a glove. So, like, I'm eight years old. Like, the normal thing would have been for me to return the money, but he didn't do that. So, you know, these are the lessons I learned early in life, you know what I mean? Um, and, and how I learned how to fight was I was getting bullied in the fifth grade, and I was getting bullied, and I came home with a black eye, and I would cry, and I was getting bullied. You know, I was a kid. And uh, my mother used to pick me up, and I would come out of the school, and I would run to my mother. She would be on the corner, and I'd run so the bullies couldn't get me. And then one day I came out of school, and my mother wasn't there. Right. So okay. I came out of the school, and my mother wasn't there. So it was either at that point in time, I either had to learn how to fight, or I had to be kept up and get bullied. So who, who was bullying me? One of the bullies was Sal Pecchio. Oh, was Sal? <laughs> Sal <Sally> Bot. <laughs> Excuse me. So I, I picked the fight. I had a fight with him, and I beat the shit out of him. And now this was 50 years ago. We're still friends today, like 50 years <laughs> later. The bully became like one of my best friends. He knows him good. And the reason why my mother wasn't there is because my father that day was home and he told my mother, where are you going? And she said, I'm going to pick Anthony up at school. And my father said, no, you ain't picking Anthony up at school no more. Anthony's going to learn how to fight. And I had to learn how to fight. So these were my lessons, but my relationship was great. Moving forward, when I was 16 and I got thrown out of school, <coughs> excuse me, and I wanted to, I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to work with him, but he wanted me to go on construction, and I didn't want to go on construction, and he told me, what do you want to do? I said, I want to work for you. And I remember like it was yesterday, we were sitting at my kitchen table, and he leaned over with his finger, and he had thick, thick hands, crooked, all his fingers he broke, and he went like this to me. He goes, you want to work for me? He goes, all right, just remember one fucking thing. Going to jail is all part of the fucking job. Those were his exact words. I get goosebumps when I think mm -hmm. of it. It happened like it was yesterday. This was when I was 16. And I said, and, and, and so the way I was raised, like I was raised in it, you know, here I am 16 and that was okay with me. Like, I, yeah, fine. And the next day he put me to work in a blackjack game on Merrick Road. At that point, to get to answer your question fully, at that point was when he started to school me about the mafia, about who was who, 
And that's when my education came into play. To a different level. All these stories came into play because I needed to know what was going on around me. Hey, everybody. Uh, get your tickets from my guy. Forget the hubs. Forget the masters. I'll read you something. Any kind of event you want to get a ticket from, go see my guy. He'll get you the right prices. Tommy Tickets. Tommy Tickets, the world is opening and events are happening. When you need tickets to the big game, Broadway play, concert, call my guy to get the lowest prices. The best seats in the house. If you don't get them, I'll get them for you. Contact me. Tommy Tickets. Yankees, the Mets, the Knicks, the Rangers, the Islanders, and more. He has them all. Call my guy, Tommy Tickets. 631-213-7675. And use the code Mafia Truth to get the absolute lowest prices of all tickets. If you need help, contact us. We'll get you those tickets. Don't pay the hubs and the masses. Don't be a fool. Don't be a sucker. Call Tommy Tickets. Text or call directly. 718-924-7615. Tommy Tickets. 718-924-7615. Call Tommy. So when you say school, like how, how is your dad teaching you or schooling you? college. So it's like, <laughs> well, how, how, he, how he schooled me was he started taking me to cl social clubs, introducing me to people, pointing out that guy so-and-so, he's a skipper, that guy clipped that guy, that guy's a killer. Um, you know, and he started taking me around with him and introducing me to people. So Sometimes, you're different groomed in it, in it so right. he knows. I mean, his whole childhood, this whole upbringing, you're around, you're seeing guys. He, is, he understands the life. Right. But now it's going to be a little more formal where he's grooming him to get strained right. out eventually and to really understand right. the, the intricacies of the mob, not just, you know, you go right. by his house when we were kids, there's every car pulling up with every yeah. guy coming up and yeah. you see cars and we'd yeah. all be out in the school. Yeah, yeah, like, celebrities in and out of my house. Because you know, you know, we know, you had every you, celebrity. Yeah, you would come to my house one day and Frankie Valley would be sitting there eating macaronis yeah. with my father. Louis Prima yeah. was in my house. Jay Black. You know what I mean? Sinatra would invite my father to come sit at his table in Jilly's. So, you know, I was raised around all this. But when I started in the life at 16, that's when he started to school me about, even school me, tell me things, things that he did. We were criminals. Even though my father was Fat Andy and he had a, my father had one of the biggest crews in the city. He had one of the, he had like 90 guys with him. Like his crew, Guys that were with him as kids became bosses later on. Nicky Carraz, the Jojo, Lenny Di Maria. These guys all were tough guys, gangsters. They became bosses, captains. So well, Tony Lee would have been there. And Tony was, Lee was his partner. Was partner the best. When he went to jail, he yeah. told Tony. Tony yeah. didn't want the position. Tony yeah. could have took any position any. he wanted. And, and people don't know that either in the history of our neighborhood, you know, because his father, he, he, he wanted to stay loyal to his father for the people that don't right. know. And his father said, You want to stay loyal to me? do what John wants when right. John took over. Exactly. Know? And I think also, I mean, what's also interesting to me is for the people that know the Mafia, and I mean, you guys obviously, your family, your name is, is Mafia royalty. Um, what is that like for you to, to know or to, to, you know, forever kind of be associated um, as mob royalty? Did you understand the magnitude when you were younger? Not when I was little. When I got into, I understood something was special about my father even at a l young age, like five, six, seven, eight. What was the first moment you realized something was special? When he took me with him to the bar. He used to take me to this bar with him on Saturday, and we were going there, and it was mob, well, two things, and it was mobbed, it was packed. And uh, everybody, oh, and they would make a rig stink when he walked in, they would stick money in my pocket, and I was allowed to go behind the bar and squirt the, play with the soda guns. So that was special, you know, like, that was like a treat. And, um, and in the and during wine season, so it doesn't even happen because like it's a different world. So on, he would go, he would go, he would take me with him when he was little to these to these big houses. John knows these big houses in Brooklyn that had great vines and and these old Italian men. And we would go to these houses during the summer, and we would sit in their yard with like wine. And they would get homemade wine, and he would talk to them, and they would like whisper in his ear, and he would drink wine with them. And I was a kid, I didn't know what was going on. And, but I always went with him. And then when I got older and I started getting the life, we, st we still, he still did that like every summer. So one time we did it and uh, they were asking him for favors. I finally figured out what was going on. Like he was doing them all favors, all these old Italian people. They were, you know, they were all with him and they were, and, and I told him, Dad, why don't we take fucking money off these people? What are they? They're giving us wine. 
And he says to me, that wine is like their blood. It's worth more than money. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you know what the problem, you know yeah. the problem. And, and I said, you asked them a question about loyalty, but they never acted like that. And I've been saying this oh. on different occasions where people talk to me when they bring it up. Later on, when you were a teenager, you understood what you had. Right. But they didn't abuse the position because they were taught a different way from his father. Mm -hmm. So you know, guys know I'm boisterous about nepotism and, and different things. These guys were, were raised gangster all the way. In other words, you had to earn your way. His father made them earn their way from a, a kid's on, mm -hmm. whether it was working these crap games, bookmaking, baseball batting somebody, hurting somebody, throwing a guy off the roof that bothered me. Mm -hmm. They did it. The father didn't do it. He didn't send yeah, these guys no. to do it. They did it. So my father <laughs> would give you the shirt off his back, pay your rent. Like, he, you know, he, he was compassionate, but yet he was violent. Like, they clipped the guy around them. They clipped the guy in the 60s around them. Tony Lee and Skinny Don and my father, they clipped this guy around them because the guy, they did a score with this guy, and, and, and then the guy kept on coming back for money, for money, for money. And then my father got twisted up one night, and they took him and said, that's it. They took him out of... Uh, the back page, the bar my father had on Atlantic and sure. Parkway. Now these are stories my father told me, and they took him out and they took him down by um uh, by Smoky Oval, 150 yeah, sure. feet. And my father made out, he had it, my father made out, he, ha he got nauseous that he always had to throw up. And Skinny Don pulled the car over, and my father was making out he had to throw up. And the guy was patting my father on the back, and Tony Lee shot the guy in the head. And then on the flip side of that, the guy had a wife and a little kid. My father put that woman on the payroll for 30 years. Wow. My father sent her a pay every week for 30 years. And how I found that story out was because I used to see the woman and I knew the son. The son did, I knew the son, but I never knew the whole, I didn't know that was the wife until one day we were in the Coral Inn or one of them places with Tony Lee and she came to see Tony Lee and then Tony Lee told me who her husband was in that they she's been on the payroll for all those years, wow. and but this is what the this is what guys like my father believed in. You know what I mean? Was it wrong for them to kill the guy? Of course it was. It's wrong for anybody to kill anybody, right? But this is this was their life. What is something or, or maybe a, a surprising story or, or fact about your father that no one could know other than you know someone on the inside like yourself? A fact about my father something you know, something that you know maybe people might perceive your father one way but you knew him obviously he's your father in a, in a light that you know he was a mama's boy yeah, he was a mama's boy and I told it's funny yes that because he was a real he was my grandmother had 14 babies in, a, in, wow. a, in, a, in, a, in an apartment on Fulton Street which is still there I took my kids to see it I said that's where your grandfather was. he was the 14th baby she gave birth to she was, he was, she was 44, so she was his pet. And his father, my grandfather, got hit by a trolley car when my father was eight years old. So my father never had a father. He was raised by Murders Incorporated. Yeah. These people raised my father, Happy Mayoni, Albert Mayoni, these people, uh -huh. the Dashit. These are the people these that are raised, serious. these are the people that raised my father. He was actually, he was raised by these people because his friends were, they were with his friend's relatives, Larry Bacala, Lenny, yeah. Lenny the Dome, my godfather. Their uncles and fathers were and got the electric chair. See, you, he yeah. goes to college. Yeah. This is a different college lesson. Yeah. Right? yeah. So you and these are serious guys yeah. that he's talking yeah. about, you, yeah. know, and, uh, and, you know, serious gangs. So now he was a mama's boy. So moving forward, now when he was in his 20s, he gets straightened out by Albert Anastasia. Now, when you get straightened out, you got to take an oath. Mm -hmm. And the oath says that the family comes before your mother. If your mother's on her deathbed and we call you, you got to come to us and let your mother die alone. And you agree to that. So my father, it was Mother's Day, and Albert Anastasia was baptizing a grandchild or something. And my father had to go to the baptism to be one of the bodyguards, one of the guys, because he was a kid. He just got straightened out. So he had no seniority, you know, like in the corporate world. So he had to go there. My grandmother brought that up till the day she died, that that was the only Mother's Day he never came to see his mother. So uh, nobody knows that about Fatty Andy. Yeah, he was uh, a mama's boy. Imagine that, a, yeah. a, a killer, but he's also a mama's boy. Yeah, yeah, and he can't go see his mother because Albert Anastasia, he had to go where the family wanted him to be, and he had to be at that christening, and he didn't see my grandmother for one Mother's Day out of his whole life, and she always brought it up.
Wow. Remember that Mother's Day? And I remember, I was a kid, remember that Mother's Day? You didn't come here to see me? Yeah, he was a mama's what, what's your What's the best memory you, you have of your father if you could, if you, if that you go back to it every time? He kissed me on the lips. My father, he loved me. Nobody loved me. No, no human being loved me like my mother didn't even love me as much as my father loved me. Wow. Mm. Your father was, you know, I know because he, he's telling killer stories. Your father was gentle with us. I mean, I mean you know, when us. we were around, you he know, loved we them. Yeah. He, and, and he loved, he like John Gotti, getting back. They loved tough kids that were good kids. Like, he was a good kid. I was good. Like, he loved, my father loved people that were like him, that were street kids that had tough, they would kill somebody, they hurt somebody, but yet they had good hearts. You know, yeah. we helped everybody. Took me to fights all the time, yeah, took yeah. me to see everybody fight. So, I mean, I saw everybody fight. Ali, Joe Frazier, Roberto Duran. I mean, I could go mm -hmm. on and on and on. The professional fights he took me to. He took me to Yankee games all the time. If you ever said anything bad about Joe DiMaggio or Rocky <laughs> Marciano, you might die. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like those were his, you ain't yeah. say, and Mario Lanza. Yeah, yeah, Mario Lanza was. You ain't saying nothing about those three guys. I don't know who that is. Mario Lanza was so well, he was. We all listened to him growing up. When Mario Lanza died, my father had tears in his my eyes. That's had a on the house all the time. Yeah. What was your, I mean, you know, what was your relationship like with uh, his father and, and maybe I mean, your best memory with him? Because they were always coaches for me. And that was always by the house. And we were always in the gym. We used to go to Lost Battalion Hall. We used to box. And Albert, your brother, was very good with his hands, too. Yes, very good. So we'd be at Lost Battalion Hall. We'd be at his house. Everybody played in front of his house because he had the schoolyard there. So we were always there. His father was always at all our games. His father loved sports. And, you know, he was just... Listen, we were always around. That, that, that was just a different era of a thing. And just like he said, he loved the roughness in kids. He wanted you to be a humble. You know, the biggest thing I, I keep saying is he taught everybody to be humble, but he also wanted you to be killers. Right. And, you know, it's, it's a hard mix because the old timers could do it. You know, you had guys mm -hmm. that were very quiet, nice guys, but then if you fuck them, yeah, you know, right. there's no con there's no yeah. even thought about it. The consequences is death. Right. Listen, there's death wise living. guys and then there's gangsters. Yeah. And my father, not because he was my father, he was a gangster. When when I when I was 16, and he gave me that speech about going to jail was all part of the job. That weekend, he tried to dis he tried to discourage me. I don't want to put it out there like he was happy that I was in the street because he really wasn't. He tried to discourage me. He wanted me to go to work, but so he took me out with him on a Friday night. We went to this bar in Brooklyn, the five o'clock lounge. I don't know it was before your time. Yeah, I don't know that one. So and it was past was one I didn't know. Yeah, I know the rest of them. In, we walk in. <laughs> We walk in and this bar, it's a Friday night, this bar is packed. I'm 16, I order a drink because, you know, I'm Fat Andy's son, right? I order a drink, I don't know, I ordered a, a, a rum and coke or some sweet girly drink I ordered. So we there and all of a sudden people start leaving. You know, hey Andy, boom, hey Andy, boom, right? So about an hour later goes by, now this place was mobbed. Look around, the place is empty, like almost empty. So my father leans over, he goes, do you see what's going on here? I said, yeah, what? I said, everybody's leaving. He goes, you know everybody's leaving? I said, no, why? He goes, because I'm here. <laughs> I said, because you're here. What are you talking about? He goes, because they don't know if I'm here to kill somebody, <laughs> punt, whack somebody, shake down somebody. So they're leaving. He said to me, so now he wanted to discourage me. He goes, is that how you want to live? But I was I was thrilled. I was like, oh my God! Yeah, I want it more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, it was the it was the greatest thing since apple pie to me. I was like, whoa! I was so proud. But that's how screwed up in the head I was. Like I was, yeah, it was. I loved it. But he tried to discourage me, being you know, that's how you want people to fear you like that. Look, nobody wants us. I'm here alone. Look, the whole bar, the whole bar emptied out. So my father wanted me to learn the game, and he schooled me, and I had to work my way up, and I had to work, you know doing this, going to jail, but I still, but, you know, it was, I still took advantage of being Fat Andy's son, don't get me wrong, like, you know, I went places that I had no business going, I got in, you know, I never waited on mine, I went to the Copa, you know, I used to take, girl, you know, the Copa Cabana, I, you know, so, yeah, there was a lot of perks. A friend of mine told me once that we were like the Kennedys, yeah, yeah that's wow. what he told me, he says, you're like, we were like the Kennedys, <laughs> I said, all right, yeah, that sounds good. But, you know, on the flip side of that, too, you know, we did a lot of damage, too, you know, to our families, my children, my mother. You know, it wasn't all glamour and fun, you know. Uh, oh, your mother went through hell. Yeah, my mother went through my kids. You know, oh, I did a lot oh. of time. My daughter was only three when I went to jail. My son was my son was uh, 13. You know, the last time I went to jail, I did eight years. They, I came out, my son was 21. <laughs> my sister had gotten arrested with this kid. 
for uh, heroin and, and credit cards. And um, my father, I went to visit my father to tell him what happened. And he says to me, you know what you got to do with this kid, right? And I said, I'm not killing this kid. And he got mad. He goes, what do you mean? You, this kid's got to go. I said, yeah, we'll keep killing everybody till she meets a fucking astronaut. <laughs> you know what I mean? I said, I'm not doing it. So he got really angry. And he says, I, I'll take care of it myself. I don't want, I'll handle it on my own. So, you know, that's not a normal father-son relationship. But, but, you know, and I actually told the kid then to run away, to leave, because he was going to get hurt. And the kid did leave, and he never got killed. So, you know, these are my, this is my life. This is and, and to wrap things up, I mean, you know, obviously the, the message of, of John's message and the message of the show is obviously to, to help kids that are either at risk or involved right. in lives of crime to stay away from it. And I think that you made a great point there um, about, you know, how it destroyed the family and... Um, ultimately, no right. one really wins from this. I guess to... to, to crime, just what I say. Right. Crime don't pay unless right. you want to pay with your life. Exactly. That's it. And, you know, in the beginning, in the beginning, it was great. My life was great. It was grandiose. I lived the one... Uh, I was living large. But at the end of the day, you know, yeah. it's not all about... It's not, all, it's not, it's not like Hollywood. Yeah. No. It's exactly. not like Hollywood. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, Anthony, thank you uh, for coming on. It was a it was pleasure. A pleasure. I'm sure we'll, we'll have you on very soon. I and, hope and so. Low for more. I know you could go for stories for hours. Um, but another quick reminder to everyone to subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't done so already. Bonus content, exclusive content, live Q&As with John, all on the Patreon. And then, again, again if you haven't done so already, subscribe to YouTube and uh, follow John. True John A. Light. And uh, www.johnalight.com, my website. New book coming in six weeks. And subscribe. And Thanks, Anthony, you have any any social media? Or you do any of that? Not yet, but I'm going to start. As soon as we start, I'll give John and Felix the information, and they'll get it out there. For Perfect. Me. And then also another quick reminder: uh, we have these custom signed bats by John. Yes. They've been quite popular. A lot of people have been reaching out to me. So reach out to me at Felix Levine on Instagram if you want to get a custom signed bat by John. And uh, John, I'm just enjoying Dino's drink. <laughs> you guys know. I really like it. Some always drinking it. <laughs> All right, guys. Beautiful. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Good night. You've been watching Mafia Truths with John Ailey. I'm Albanian blood.